Bye. Guys that are from uh, Facebook, uh, and also if you're going to watch the video later, you're also welcome. You're always welcome. Uh, so uh, this morning, I I would like to share two scriptures with you. It's it's not too long, but I, I really feel that it, it it spoke to us this morning when we um, got together praying uh, before the time. So I'd like to share that with you, and then I've got another scripture that I'd like to share. So the first one is on Isaiah 40, and I'm thinking I should have used my phone, but it's okay. It seems to be holding. So, um, yeah, this morning we said, you know, uh, this has been a tough time, uh, and we sometimes feel exhausted, worn out, maybe difficult finding to, uh, it's maybe difficult to find the strength to push on and push forward, but I'd like to encourage us with a scripture from Isaiah 40, and it starts off where, um, the people are saying, Lord, don't you notice that we're going through a tough time? And verse 27, it says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded by my God. Do you feel like this maybe this morning? If you are, don't lose hope. Because have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases strength. God gives us the strength. Now this part really spoke to me because I've got a young boy that just always has energy and runs around, never gets tired. Even youths shall faint and be weary. And young men like um, Arnold and Leo. Even young men, yeah, Alex, I don't know, eh? Uh, even young men shall fall exhausted. But, <laughs> but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So that's really just to encourage us this morning that we should not rely on our own strength. We should not look around and be anxious or tired or don't know where we're getting the strength from. We know where we're getting our strength from. We're getting our strength from God, the everlasting God. So now this morning, you know, we've got something to sing about. You know, we've got really something to be glad about and i'd like to read for us from psalm 57 from verse 7 my heart is steadfast O god my heart is steadfast why because i trust in god i will sing and make melody awake my glory awake O harp and lyre i will awake the dawn i will give thanks to you O lord among the peoples I will sing praise to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. Lord Jesus, and today we really want to lift up your name. Lord, we want to bring thanks to you. We want to sing thanks to you. We want to just... Praise your name, Lord, this morning as we know that you give us the strength. You never, ever leave us alone. You never forsake us. You never grow weary or tired. You are always there for us, Lord. Lord, and you are so magnificent, so glorious, Lord, that we, we, we just want to praise your name this morning. We pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Just bless us this morning, Lord, with your presence. Let your Holy, Holy Spirit just touch our hearts this morning and encourage us, Lord. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Salvin. Thanks, Bernie. 
Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together and worship Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hello. Nick, are we on? It'll help with you. Good. Thanks, Nick. We've got a new life in the line of your love Called by name to the Savior of all We've got a new song generations will sing oh, 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 oh. We've got a new hope all because of the cross Saved by the grace you've given to us We've got a new song now that we are redeemed oh, oh, oh. your glory we will give all we are all our lives for the love of your son we've got a new song now that we are redeemed oh 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 oh, 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 oh. for your name shines in all the earth great above our lives light of our salvation Nations rise, sing of all you are. Holy is your name, lifted high forever. For your name, for your name shines in all the earth. Great above our lives, light of our salvation. Nations rise. Sing of all you are, holy is your name, lifted high forever. And our hope is in the Savior's love, you gave it all. Let all Christ our King, be lifted up, and our hope is in the Savior's love, you gave it all, let all earth sing to Christ our King. salvation nations rise sing of all you are holy is your name lifted high forever for your name for your name great above our lives light of our salvation Nations rise, sing of all you are. Holy is your name, lifted high forever. For your name shines in all the earth. Great above our lives, light of our salvation. Nations rise. Sing of all you are, holy is your name, lifted high forever. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you and bless your name. In your name there is power, Lord, and there is life. Thank you, Jesus, 
for your spirit that flows. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. So I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder. You're going to hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive yeah. I raise a hallelujah With everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. Oh, let's sing to Jesus. So I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, open the rise. Death is defeated, the king, I'm going to sing. So I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is worship you Jesus as we sing a little louder so sing a little louder 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 in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder, heaven comes to fight for me. Hey, sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder, heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. So I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. So I'm going to sing in 
the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Oh I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Let's sing to him, church. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In Jesus, we sing. I raise a is enough more than I need at your word I will believe I wait for you draw near again let your spirit make me new and I will fall at your I will fall at your feet And I will worship you here um, oh, This previous song that we sang, you know um, but loud Nick thanks um, it says you know my weapon is a melody it doesn't mean that you know that's giving me the strength or that's giving me the victory it's just the weapon it's God that gives me the victory and as you as we sang the other um, words in that song it, it said you know the king is alive and, and we trust in Him. And I think, you know, as we continue worshiping now, let's really just focus on God and, and seek our strength from Him and, and during this worship. Yeah. Your grace. Your grace is enough more than I need. At Your word I will believe. I Draw near again Let your spirit make me new And I will fall at your feet I will fall at your feet And I will worship you Your prayer. 
presence in me Jesus light the way By the power of your word I am restored I am redeemed By your spirit I am free And I will fall at your feet I will your feet and I will worship you here Jesus we worship you thank you Lord that you came so freely Freely you gave. Yeah, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that we can just fall at your feet. And Lord, as we fall at your feet and as we look to you, Lord, we are renewed and we are encouraged and strengthened. Lord, it's so amazing, Lord, to know that that's all we need to do is to surrender to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to minister to us through your spirit today. We pray that, Lord, also in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Salvin and the mechanics. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've got a few announcements, just two really. Uh, the first one is that um, the list, oh yes, for the kids. Okay, so we're doing that one first. Um, so we are um, putting some, uh, what's it, packets together that we're going to hand out for kids. I think Donny mentioned quite a big number, I think 300 or 400, something like that. So there's 400, thank you. Uh, do I have 500? Do I have a five? <laughs> so yeah, 400 packets that we're going to put together. So those are the items that we uh, want to put into that packet per kid. So, if you want to contribute, please, you know, um, start getting these things together. Uh, I think we can give it to Jade, 
And the last date to give it is on the 13th of December. That's the date that we're going to, you know, then start putting the packets together. So you've got time until the 13th of December to put the pa or get the things together for the packets. And then, of course, you know, I, I suppose the packets are going to be built or, or, you know, put together. If you want to help with that also, I think just talk to Jade, uh, you know, and uh, I think the more hands we can have to help with that also, the better. Good. So that's the second one. So now my first one, tithes and offering. So there's going to be a basket at the door where you can, you know, um, put in your tithes and offering, and, you know, and... We always say it and we always mean it, you know, it's part of our worship. It's acknowledging God as our provider. That's why we do it. You know, God doesn't need our money. Um, it's just to say, God, we acknowledge that you provide this for us and that's why we want to give it back to you. Good. Then uh, Donnie and Renell are not here this morning. Uh, they're not hiding in the building. They're actually not here. They are at Mtunzini. Yes, I got that right. Mtunzini today at Anchor Church. Yes. Uh, ministering there to the, the guys there. Um, so they've put a short video or recorded a short video that they just asked uh, us to play. So very good morning to all of you at City Life. Uh, as you will have noticed this morning, Renel and I are away We've been doing exactly what we've been preaching. We've gone to another part of our province. And for the very first time, we've been spending time with a church up the north coast in Mtunzini called Anchor Church. Uh, we spent some time with the elders on Friday night, and then we would have been with the leaders on Saturday. And then by the time you listen to this, we'll be preaching um, at the meeting on Sunday morning. So, yeah, I just wanted to say to you, thank you so much for your prayers. Please keep us in prayer. It's been a difficult time and a challenging time for churches all over, um, not just our country, but the world. And so we've really felt that we, we needed to go and just be a blessing and to help and to teach and to train at these churches. Um, and so, yeah, we really appreciate the partnership uh, as we do these things for the Lord and advance His kingdom beyond just what happens here at City Life. Now, you guys have a special treat this morning. Um, I'm sure the guys, Bernie and them, will introduce Anna. But just from my side, I wanted to say, if you've never heard Anna preach, Greg and Anna, we've known them for many, many years, and they've been such a blessing in the kingdom of God. They've been consistent for many, many years. And we've just watched how God has used them to minister to many people, um, to many churches. And so this morning as Anna preaches, uh, I want you to know that it's someone who we trust. It's someone who we know their lifestyle, we know how they live. And you can certainly, certainly know that they're a, um, a trusted couple in the kingdom of God. We look forward to ourselves listening to what God has to say through her on the live feed at some point. But yeah, looking forward to being together with you again um, next week. We're trusting that Jesus Christ would be exalted this morning as you meet together. Uh, like we always say, it's not about the team. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the music. It's about Jesus Christ. So we want to encourage you to make the most of Jesus Christ wherever you go and whatever you do. And most certainly from Renel myself, we send our love and our praise for you guys. Have a good one. Cheers. As Donnie's. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, as Donnie mentioned, uh, Anna is sharing with us a message this morning. And uh, yeah, Anna, I don't know if you want to step up. Uh, maybe we'll just move a, a few things around here for you. Let's do that. Yeah, perfect. And then, you know, I think before you preach, let's maybe just pray. 
Yeah, Lord Jesus, we just want to pray your blessing on Anna now as, as she's an instrument in your hands this morning, Lord. And we ask that you would just speak through her the word that you want to share with us this morning. And we just want to bless her with that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Anna, over to you. Thanks, everybody. Oh, we'll have a bit of a fiddle around with the microphone there. Better? Here we are. Um, okay. So this morning, you can pop away your Bibles, you can put away your phones, you can put away your tablet, you can put away your notebooks. Uh, at home, if you are sitting and listening, a nice coffee. We're sort of working, we're sort of working, I'll just keep talking. Um, and we're going to tell some stories this morning. We're going to, I will be bringing in a little bit of the Bible, so don't. Oh, Craig's going to give me a different microphone. Um, oh, there we are. You can hear me now. So um, I'm going to tell some stories. Uh, I have a couple of stories that, that I want to share with you this morning. Um, stories that I hope will inspire us and stories that will... Um, just encourage us to keep on doing the things that we're already doing. You know, these are, this particular first story is a, a real story of romance, but it's not the romance of a boy meets a girl. This is the romance of Jesus coming down from heaven and laying down his life for the sake of sinners. That, that's how romantic our God is. He comes and does things which are amazingly just so different to the way that we would expect things to be done. You might want to keep a little tissue handy because some of the stories get a little bit, little bit sad. And we always know that whoever stands at the front always ends up crying. So that's, that's how we do things. All right. <sighs> this is a church where people always cry. <sighs> Just sorry about that, everybody. Joy. Tears of joy. Yeah, tears of joy. Tears of, tears of, of romantic emotion, I suppose. Hey? All right. Let's get started. Ah, Leo, where are you? There you are. Okay, you can put up the next one. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if we, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God." For even here and two were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving as an example that ye should follow his steps. Okay, we don't normally use that version of the Bible, do we? That's the one from 1500 or something or other. And on this day in 1665, a young man stood in a church in a little village in the north of England, and he said those exact words. He read those words, that version of the Bible. He read those words and he probably was feeling a little bit smug and a little bit victorious because this man had just come through and brought his people through a period of suffering. This man was a man called William Mompesson and he, he was the, the reverend. Here he is. Look, isn't he a handsome fellow? Look at all those kind of curly hair, like flowing locks landing on his cheeks there. Reverend Mompesson was the vicar of the Church of St. Lawrence's in the village of Eam in England. Why do I even want to tell you the story of Reverend, of Reverend William Mompesson? Two, two months previously, in September 1665, another young man had arrived in the village of Eam. This young man was called George Vickers. And George was carrying with him a box. And in that box was some cloth that he had brought from London to deliver to the tailor who lived in Eam. Now, the tailor's name was Alexander Hadfield. George Vickers arrived and he took his cloth, took his box of cloth and presented it to Alexander. Alexander and George opened the box with great anticipation that Alexander was now going to create some wonderful clothes or whatever for his community. They opened the box and imagine their horror when all the cloth was damp and it was moldy and it was smelly and I was like, oh, this is such a waste. So what they decided to do was, you know what, we've got to dry this stuff. So they took it out and with the help of Alexander's wife, Mary Cooper, because she was a widow, so she had remarried Alexander and she had two young children. 
With, with Mary's help, they grab the cloth and they hang it out over their range in the kitchen. And as the cloth dried out, everyone thought, no, this, this is great. But you know what else happened as the, as the cloth warmed up? There was a, a little nest of fleas living in the cloth. And as the, as the room heated up, as the cloth heated up, the fleas woke up. And the fleas decided, you we're kind of hungry, so we actually need to go somewhere and find some people to eat. So off they hopped. Hop, 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 hop. And they hopped around the home of Alexander Hadfield, and they hopped around the home of a couple of other families next door on either side of Alexander Hadfield. At the same time in September 1665, London was under the grip of the bubonic plague. I don't know if you've heard of the bubonic plague. It's not a very pleasant plague. It does still exist in uh, places like India. Uh, it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but it does still exist. The bubonic plague was spread from the blood of rats, and do you know how it was spread? From fleas. So the fleas that George Vickers had carried all the way from London, all the way into the little village of Eam, that now woke up in the kitchen of Alexander Hadfield, had little droplets of bubonic plague. They hopped around and they bit the people, and the people caught the plague. By around about mid-September, George Vickers himself had died. See, this is why we're going to need tissues. It's really sad. So George Vickers had died. One of Mary Cooper's young children had caught the disease and had died. In October, so over the course of September, five, more, five people died, caught the disease and died in September. In October, let me just see if I've got the number that it was in October. I think it was... 23. 23 people had contracted the disease and had died. Now, let me just, I just want to make that something very clear here. This is not a disease that is pleasant. This is not a disease where there were hospitals and where there were nice doctors and nice nurses able to minister to us. This was a disease that was revolting. So the people, first of all, you got you know, bitten by the fleas. Well, I suppose that would have been quite itchy and unpleasant. Then you developed a fever, like a really, really hectic fever. And then a rash would break out all over your body. <clears throat> and then the rash would kind of develop almost little blisters. And then the blisters would go horrible and manky. And you'd end up with gangrene. And then the, the people would be dying and their flesh would be hanging. It's a lovely Sunday morning message, isn't it? Isn't this great? People are dying and their flesh are hanging off. So their bodies would, would turn black. Their tongues would swell. They'd have fever, they'd have vomiting. It was a horrendous disease. I don't know if you know, if you know the children's little song, ring a ring of roses, pock full of posies, tissue, tissue, we all fall down. That was from the plague. So people would get these rashes that were called like roses, rosy rashes, all over their bodies. The pocket full of posies was a little, um, almost like a little collection of herbs and, and sweet-smelling flowers that people would keep around their noses. There was a belief that the plague was spread not from fleas because people didn't know about that. They actually thought it was in the air, that it was like a miasma in the air. And so if they kept this little pocket full of posies around their, around their nose, they'd be protected. Kind of sounds like a mask, hey? So that's what they would do around their nose. A tissue, a tissue. They'd catch the cold. They'd, catch, they'd be sneezing. They'd be coughing. And then they'd die. Now we go to November, and amazingly, the numbers started to drop. Amazingly, our William, as he's standing there, and he's speaking these very words that were spoken on this day. Remember, I'm not, this is the Church of England had prescribed what had to be spoken, what passages of Scripture had to be used throughout all of Christendom so far as the Church of England was concerned, on a particular day of the year. And on this particular day, the 29th of October, this was the passage of Scripture that William was reading. And on the same day, the numbers in, in his village were dropping. So he's got a kind of an excuse for why he was feeling a bit victorious and smug. Here he is, he's talking about, For what glory is it, if when ye be buffeted for your fault, ye shall take it patient, patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, Ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. He is standing and feeling as though he has been made acceptable before God because he has endured suffering together with his village. On this day, the 29th of November, 1665, a young lady called Elizabeth Warrington 
was the last person to die of the plague in Eam in November. We just remember Elizabeth. She's a real person. It's not a story I've made up from a book. Elizabeth was a real person who died of the plague 355 years ago today. Then, winter came. So as winter came, this has actually ended up being one of the worst winters that the region had known. It was really, really, really cold. And of course, we know that fleas tend to hibernate again when it's cold. So there were less fleas hopping about, and there were less people getting sick. So in December, there were only two or three people who, who fell ill and died. In, in January, the number continued to decrease. In February, the numbers decreased. And then in March, it started to get a little bit warmer. And the days got a little bit longer, and the sun got a little bit hotter, and people started falling sick again. It was a second wave. I think we've got Henry and Anne in the UK listening. Much of Europe is going through a second wave right now. A second wave is frightening because you think you're done with it. You think you've dealt with things, and now it's back again. So here's old William, and he's done his preach, and he's led the people through, but now he's finding that people are falling sick again. So what's he going to do? By the beginning of June, in May, only two people died. So it's like, well, that's not too bad. But at the same time, many were lying sick in bed. Now, there's no cure for the plague. They used to do all kinds of funny things. One of the things they used to do is they would take a pigeon and they'd pluck its tail feathers and then they'd place the bare pigeon bottom on the um, saw, on the, you know, like on the, 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 the blistery saw. And they'd take the pigeon and sit it on the saw and hope that it would get better. They did all kinds of really weird stuff. I think there was another one where they boiled frogs or something like that. I can't remember what it was. I think it was boiling frogs. Oh, so they get to the beginning of June, and William is thinking, oh, we've really got a problem. There are lots of people in my village who are unwell, and I'm going to have to make some changes. So William thinks, okay, you know what I'm going to do? Lockdown. Yay, we all know about lockdowns. But this was a lockdown of note. His was a village of about 350 people, and he decided that what he was going to do was cordon off the area so that nobody could leave the village and nobody could come into the village. He made arrangements. He was going to make arrangements for there to be various different drop-off points, click and collect from 1665, where people would go and drop off the provisions that were needed in the village, and, and then people from within the village could go up and collect them and could drop off their money and could collect letters or whatever and send letters outside. So this village was going to be completely cut off from the surrounding community, partly because he wanted to protect his own community, but also because he was aware that if the plague went out of the village, it was going to spread like wildfire throughout their region. In the region near him, there were various different villages, but there was also the big industrial city of Sheffield. And I'm from Sheffield, so that's why I know this story rather well. So he decided, yeah, you know, we're going to protect the village. We're going to protect the community. We're going to, we, we're going to keep, keep ourselves enclosed. He, did two, he wanted to do two other things. He wanted to stop church services happening in his building. Now, they didn't have Ancilla and Alex and Leal and, and uh, Arnold. <laughs> I was about to call you Anton. I was thinking, no, man, it's definitely not Anton. And Arnold, able to help with cameras and internet, so what they did was they closed their church and they had outdoor services. You need to know this is really radical for the Church of England of 1666 now. This was not something that was normal. This was not something that was even acceptable during those times. The next thing that he, de that he decided he wanted to do was to stop burials within the churchyard, to stop group um, funerals. And he, turned to, he wanted to turn to the people and to say to them, you're now going to have to bury your dead at home. You're going to have to dig your own graves. There was a belief that it was the, uh, almost like the, the decaying body of the, of the dead person. Sorry, it's a bit unpleasant. But the decaying body of the dead person, that the fumes that were given off were what would um, spread the plague to other people. So people didn't want to come in contact with the dead. So there was an he wanted to make an arrangement that they would actually now be buried at home. Do you know how serious that was for the people of 1666? Their loved ones would no longer be, be buried in consecrated sacred ground. 
The only people in those times who were not buried in consecrated sacred grounds were those who committed suicide because they were considered beyond the grace of God. So now he was wanting to say to people, actually, you know, you've just lost your loved one, but now I can't allow you to be buried in sacred ground. You're going to have to be buried outside that, that space. How were people going to know that their souls rested in peace? That was a really big thing, like much bigger than I think would be for us today. But our William had a problem. So he had all these ideas, and he had all of these uh, solutions, which were all very, very wonderful, very extreme, but helpful. But William wasn't very well liked. So the problem goes back to a little bit of English history here. <sighs> there was a civil war in England in the 1650s, let's say, rough, roughly that time. And part of the reason for the civil war was all to do with the king and his role in parliament and, and so on and so on. Um, but also there was a lot of religious change. Now, how many of you have heard of the Puritans or you've heard of the nonconformists? The Puritans and the nonconformists were preachers who basically did their own thing in the eyes of the Church of England. So they would preach whatever scripture they felt for the day. Um, they, would, they concentrated a lot on the Holy Spirit. They spoke a lot about salvation. They spoke a lot about eternity. They wanted to apply the cross of Christ to the individual rather than just this general... See what we where we get our understanding and our, our faith from? It's those people, the people who looked at a different way of looking at the gospel. Now, the problem was, in 1660, the second King Charles was brought from exile, and he came back to England, and it was all rah, 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 yay, we've got a king again. But what happened is the Church of England said, oh, you know, we've had enough. We can't, we can't do this thing of just preachers willy-nilly picking out verses and choosing what they want to preach. We need to have a blanket approach. We need to know what's being preached on what day by, by every person. We even need to write out the prayers so we know what prayers are being prayed. So in 1662, they developed what was called the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer is still used today in the Church of England, amazingly. Some churches use it more than others. But at the time, in 1665 now, so there's this book, 16, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, by the time old William came along, the problem was Thomas Stanley was a man who had been the vicar of St. Lawrence's Church before William. And Thomas Stanley was a nonconformist Puritan preacher. And what the church did was they said, okay, look, we've got this book now that lays out what you're supposed to preach. It lays out what you're supposed to talk about. And so if you refuse as a minister to use our book, we're going to throw you out of the church. So Thomas Stanley was removed from the leadership of St. Lawrence's Church, and William Momperson was brought in his place. Now, Thomas was really popular. The people really liked him. They liked what he preached. They liked who he was. They liked how simple he was. And suddenly, from on high, down in London, they're suddenly told, you need to get rid of this man. And in actual fact, what the, the law was that if you'd been a nonconformist Puritan preacher... When you lost your job, you were not allowed to live within a five-mile radius of your previous parish because they were concerned that you would continue to sow dissension as it would have been seen. Interestingly, the villages of Eam, this shows you... Yes, the village. I haven't told you the name of the village. The village of Eam. The, um, interesting, the, the villagers of this little village in the north of England called Eam decided that they really liked Thomas and they wanted him to stay. And they actually found him a home within the village. It was against the law. And they found him a home in the village and they clubbed together a few of them and gave him a salary. So you, you need to realize Thomas Stanley was this super popular, super well-loved man. And William Momperson had come in and replaced him. So William was not a liked man, but Thomas was. So what does William need to do to make his plans work? Who's he going to have to ask to help him convince the people? He's got to go to Thomas Stanley. So now we've got William Momperson, who is very well connected. He's connected to the gentry. He's connected to all that is good and right and all that is royal in 1665 and 1666. And he's now having to go to a man that he actually despises. He despises his theology. He despises his way of life. He, he knows that if Thomas clicks his fingers, the, the people will jump. 
But he has to lay aside his own differences and he has to go humbly to Thomas and say, actually, can you help me? Can we together work, work through this? And equally, Thomas Stanley, he'd been kicked out of his job. Potentially, he was kicked out of his home. He, was, he had no life now. He's got, he, he'd lost his wife. He was a widower. What does he do with himself? And now here comes along William, the person who'd kicked him out of his job, and says, oh, please can you help me? That's amazing. These two men decided to put aside their differences. They decided to lay down their theologies. They decided to say, actually, what is greater is the love of the people. Let us love the people, and as we love the people, so together we can, we can make this right. So Thomas and William joined forces, and they did exactly what William had, had thought would be a good idea. They closed down the village. They... Um, they conducted services in an area outside. It was like a little outdoor area with rocks and trees and things like that. They stopped all burials. And they suffered with the people. In August 1666, 78 people died of the plague. 78 people. This is a village of only 350. 78 people died, one of which was William Monpesson's wife, Catherine. At the beginning of June, William had very sneakily sent away his children to go and live in Sheffield and stay away from the plague. But Catherine had insisted that she stay at her husband's side. So herself, the Reverend Monpesson, Thomas Stanley, they visited the sick. They ministered to the sick. They suffered with the sick. And then one day, Catherine Mompesson was out walking with her husband, and she said, does not the air smell so sweet today? The air smelled anything but sweet, because 78 people were lying stinking and dying. And he knew straight away that his wife had caught the illness, and it had affected her, her mind and affected her sense of smell, and she died. A few days after Catherine died, you see, it is very sad. A few days after Catherine died, a lady called Elizabeth Hancock buried her husband and seven of her children. Two of her children died at the beginning of August on the same day. Four of her children died on the same day in the middle of August. She was literally, there's an area um, just outside the village where she had buried her loved ones. She literally was going home, dragging another dead body taking it to the grave, burying it, going back, hoping that her child had survived and finding her child dead and having to take that child and bury that child. This is not an easy story. This is not an easy life. So why, why am I telling you such an awful, awful story? Because by the 29th of November, 1666... Our Reverend William is reading our same scripture again. Because remember, it's a perpetual thing and they read the same thing on the certain dates. And now he stands and he says, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. William has suffered and he has taken it patiently. He stands a broken man and he thinks, well, what was the point? I've lost my wife. By the time he's reading this, of the 350 villagers, less than 100 were left. About 75 were left. But do you know what? Not a single case of the plague was recorded outside of the boundary of that village of Eam. Um, Lil, just put up the slide of the newspapers. 2020, the world suddenly has another plague. The world is suddenly put in lockdown. The world is told you've got to make changes. You can't have church. You, you can't meet together. Where does the world turn? You can put it up. The world turned to Reverend William Momperson, to Thomas Stanley, and to the people of the village of Eam. These are just a couple of examples. Almost every major newspaper in the world 
Not just these happen to be mainly UK ones. But every major use newspaper in the world quoted the story of the village of Eam and Reverend Mompesson. That man wouldn't have thought that 400 years later people were going to be talking about him. All he knew was that he was broken and he'd given his best, but had it worked. 355 years later, people are still talking about him. What William did was an insignificant ripple that stretched across 400 years. And then we can now look and say, wow, that, that's amazing. It's an insignificant ripple that stretches across centuries. Second story. We have a poor widow. Her name is Sarah, let's say. Sarah has to get ready to go to temple. She's getting herself dressed. She's finding a shawl. She knows that when she's at temple, she's going to have to give some kind of an offering because that's what you do when you go to the temple. She searches and she finds two little coins. She knows that those are her last two coins. She knows she has nothing left. So she takes the coins and she wraps them in a little bit of rag and she pops them in the pocket of her skirts and she goes to temple. She arrives at temple and in front of her is a man in flowing expensive robes and he's throwing things into the offering and every time it lands there's a big chink and a clang and everybody around him knows, oh, he's putting in a lot. And then he throws in another handful and he's all, oh, look at me, look at what I've got. And the little widow, our friend Sarah, head bowed, waiting in the queue. It's like, oh, this is so embarrassing. I've got my little twist of two coins in my pocket. Eventually, our wealthy man moves on, and it's Sarah's turn. And as Sarah takes the little rag out of her pocket and unfolds it and looks at the two coins and... Oh, if she puts them both in, what's she going to do for lunch? Where's she going to get her bread? But then she knows if she holds one back, she knows that it's not going to be, she's not going to be right in her heart. And while she's having this little debate with herself, she doesn't notice a group of young men standing nearby. She doesn't notice that one of that group is paying really close attention to what she's doing. Oh, so she takes a deep breath. She hopes that nobody's noticing how small her little offering is, and she quietly puts it in. There's no noise. There's no, yo, yeah, look at me. She just bows her head, she puts it in, and then she walks away. But that, in that group of men, there was the one who was watching, and then he turns to the other group of men who were standing with him, and he says, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. Our little widow, Sarah, dropped a ripple. She dropped a stone that caused an insignificant ripple. But Jesus was watching. And Jesus noticed and as he watched and as he noticed, it got recorded. And then we're now reading it 2,000 years later. That lady's insignificant ripple stretches through the centuries to churches today, to Christians today, who when we're talking about generosity and when we're talking about proper giving and when we're talking about the way that we should give humbly but, but fully, this is the lady we talk about. I don't know that she was called Sarah. I'm just saying she's just giving her a name so we can actually identify her. Her little insignificant ripple affects my life today. Her insignificant ripple stretches through to eternity. You know, there are times, I think, when we can feel that unless we are a big personality, unless we have big plans, unless we perform grand gestures, we make no difference. That what we do is so small, it is so insignificant. The kindness I show to the checkout person in pick and pay. The person who bought 
Sean's groceries. It's insignificant. Might not have felt insignificant to Sean, but it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Nobody knows about it. It's no, there's no song and dance. We go through our lives daily performing little, daily throwing little stones that create insignificant ripples. But when we throw those stones and we see the beginning of the insignificant ripple, and we understand that Jesus is standing watching, Jesus is watching, and Jesus takes our little stone and our insignificant ripple, and he stretches the ripples right out, and he stretches them through generations, and he stretches them through centuries, and he stretches them through eternity, so that my insignificant ripple actually has eternal reach. William Mompesson had no idea the impact his actions were going to take. All he knew was that he was now a widower with two children to look after. Thomas Stanley had no idea that laying down his own plans and his own ideas and his own theology would enable him to partner with a man who he despised and yet bring about a change in a village where they laid down their lives for the sake of their community. If those two men had not been there, the village of Eam would not have laid down their lives. They'd have run away. Do you know not one single person ran away? Well, they do think maybe a couple. But nobody actually ran away. They stayed. They knew that they were staying to die. And they stayed because of the insignificant actions that caused insignificant ripples by William and Thomas. Just in closing, I want to read one last thing that I think William would have read at some point during the course of his terrible year. Maybe even on the day that his wife died. Perhaps this was something he read. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Let us not be weary in well-doing, not let us not be weary in grand designs and big gestures, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... I don't know that William ever felt that he reached his due season where he reaped anything. But now in 2020, that man is reaping because people are talking about him and they're talking about the sacrifice that he encouraged his people to make. In due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Let us not be a people who give up and say, this is too hard and it's the end of the year and I'm fed up and I just want a holiday and I do want a holiday and I'm so frustrated because I'm tired and everybody's tired and we're fed up and we've had enough and we want this stupid COVID to go away and we want masks to not exist anymore and, and we want just to be able to live normally. I think William probably felt the same. I think he probably stood there daily and looked at his church while they were out in the fields and thought, oh, when is this going to pass? Every week there'd be a different family missing. Every week he knew what they were going through. And he would have said, can I not just escape? Who would have noticed? There was no fence. It was just a few stones in the fields. There was nothing stopping him from running away. There's nothing stopping the others from running away. What kept them there was the desire to not be weary in well-doing and to love the people of his village and of the wider community. And as he chose that, he said, if we faint not, if we faint not, we shall reap in the right season, in the due season. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, you know, and, and I think what she said speaks for itself, you know. The small things matter. And uh, we should never, ever, ever think that, ah, oh, no, that's so small. I don't need to do it, really. If God puts something on your heart to do, do it faithfully. That's what he wants. He wants obedience. He'll do the rest. He'll do the miracles. Thank you, Anna. Great. Okay, guys, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, go outside again, but please don't run away. 
We've got some stones around the... We've got a fence, actually. We're closing the gate, so you can't run away. <laughs> um, we, we're going to make some coffees now and hot chocolate. Please stay around, have a chat. Um, enjoy the company of fellow believers. And you know, if anybody wants to you know, pray maybe with somebody or, or you know, if you feel that the word maybe spoke to you and, and uh, calls you to do something, please talk to one of us and uh, yeah, we'd love to pray with you and spend some time with you. Thank you very much. And I don't know if we're still online. Are we still online? Okay. And for the guys that's online, enjoy your coffee or tea as well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again.